usual way. Um, today I'm going to talk about one of the projects that we do at JetBrains Research. And I am, as I think you all figured it out, it will be about Kotlin and Kotlin code anomalies. Well, I'm not here to officially promote Kotlin. We have specially trained people for this. But uh, we have to understand uh, what they're looking at. So mm, another sh show of hands, how many of you tried Kotlin? Whoa, this is, this is awesome. Anyway, uh, so brief introduction. Um, Kotlin is a general purpose statically typed programming language that both features uh, object-oriented and functional uh, features. So uh, it was designed to uh, interoperate with Java fully, uh, and uh, originally it was targeted uh, JVM and Android platforms, but now it can be compiled to JavaScript and to even to native code via LLVM. Um, it's open source. Uh, it's relatively young, uh, but have uh, active and continuously growing community. So uh, we should focus on the tooling uh, around this uh, language. Um, for most people, Kotlin looks like a more streamlined version of Java, uh, with its extension functions, coroutines, uh, properties, uh, nullability analysis, and different features. And when people use these cool features, their code uh, generally becomes uh, more clean and concise. But there are always people who do things differently. Uh, for some reason, we have uh, an implementation of uh, fourth compiler in Kotlin. You know, this stack-based language from the 70s. Who knows why it was written, but as GitHub states, it's written in Kotlin, 100%. Uh, and Sometimes it doesn't look like Kotlin at all. Um, we call these code fragments anomalies in a way that uh, they, they're, they're good code. Uh, it's syntactically correct. It may even work very well. But it doesn't look like the code that other people use, uh, write in this language. Um, and these code fragments are actually of great interest to language developers because well, they could uh, show some previously unnoticed uh, compiler bugs or uh, highlight some compiler performance issues or even could be used uh, to get hints on how to improve the language further. So uh, the informal tag description that we've got from the Kotlin developer team uh, was take all Kotlin code in the world and bring us some weirdly looking programs. Um, and like in risk management, it's pretty hard to plan for known unknown, uh, and it's much harder to plan for unknown unknown when you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, before we clarify what this could mean and how to achieve this, uh, let's see uh, what can be done in this field. If you Google code uh, anomaly detection, you, uh, well, you find something. Uh, some of the papers uh, listed here, the first two of them are uh, based on Static analysis. Uh, the first one presents Grooveminer tool, which tries to uh, detect anomalous objects interactions. So it takes the code, builds a directed to cyclic graph. Uh, this features uh, constructor method calls and their dependencies, uh, and tries to apply uh, graph anomaly detection techniques to find atypical areas in this graph. Uh, the second uh, one uses somewhat similar idea, uh, but they uh, build the uh, usage uh, models of objects using their sequences of method calls. Uh, and they also apply graph-based uh, anomaly detection techniques. Um, they are very helpful if you're trying to find bugs in your programs. So uh, you, these approaches basically target language users, not language developers, as we are intended. Um, the next papers are based on dynamic analysis. Um, the deduce tool uh, tries to run your program and store every value of every expression that it encounters. And it tries to induce some uh, invariant rules. And when these rules are violated, for example, some expression gets a value that, well, it differs a lot from all its previous values, well, it's considered a candidate anomaly. Um, the last one here also runs the program, but collects uh, traces of system calls. But nevertheless, uh, we have uh, a huge data set in mind. 
and well projects have all kinds of weird dependencies and who knows how they're supposed to be run um, so um, I think we should limit ourselves with static analysis only okay getting back to the task at hand uh, what should we analyze uh, originally we targeted the regular Kotlin uh, that works on the JVM uh, so we have the source code and the bytecode produced from it. Uh, we should analyze both of them because analyzing source code gives us patterns in incorrect language use, while analyzing bytecode provides us with uh, compiler issues. Uh, but what's best, we can combine these analyses together. Uh, for example, we could search for code fragments that uh, were not anomalous in the source code representation, but became anomalous in bytecode representation. And that's clearly an issue of some kind. Next, uh, at what level should we look at the code? Uh, well, obviously looking at operators, uh, single operators or lines of code doesn't make any sense because uh, it, they do, don't capture structures complex enough to form an anomaly. Uh, functions seem like a good choice because they're large enough to uh, have some code that can form an anomaly, but small enough to represent one single operation on a class. Uh, classes also seem like a good choice if you want to look for anomalies in uh, inheritance, in function signatures, or uh, control flow, for example, to long chains of function calls whatsoever. Um, Files could be used if you want to search for anomalies in class interaction, and projects seem to too large and too domain specific. You can uh, actually uh, analyze the project without knowing uh, what it was created for. So, um, moving on to how. Uh, there's uh, data science uh, and there's anomaly detection techniques. Uh, we could uh, uh, use a standard task of anomaly detection on vectorized data. Uh, and then when we get some anomalies, uh, we should somehow, somehow classify them according to the type. And that's another task, uh, another t challenging task. Speaking about code representation, it's, well, it's really a hot research topic right now. Um, but basically all these uh, approaches fall into two categories. Uh, the first one are explicit, explicit features, uh, basically software metrics like the height of the AST uh, uh, or cohesion coupling metrics. Uh, and some natural language processing uh, features like bag of words or uh, their derivatives. Um, these features are very descriptive. So uh, you just look at the vector value that you've got and almost always you have a good hypothesis on uh, what's wrong with this code and why it was considered an anomaly, uh, which is very good. But um, these features are hard, hard to choose uh, because, well, first of all, software metrics uh, are very, uh, well, gray area uh, because they uh, mostly rely on opinions on what good code is, uh, and this is highly subjective. Uh, also, it's hard to choose them uh, because when, when you don't know what you're looking for, so you have to specifically specify, uh, precisely specify what are you looking for with these metrics. Uh, there's also path-based representations, uh, trending approach, uh, that mm, uh, basically uh, allows you to traverse the tree and uh, s collect all the nodes uh, types in this uh, syntax tree that you encounter, and then use these paths to well, uh, do some research on it. Um, there, uh, an alternative here is uh, implicit features uh, that uh, mostly uh, could be described as engrams, uh, some kind of neural networks processing, uh, AST, hashing, and different kinds of d distributed representations. Uh, while they're very, uh, well, they obviously lack expressiveness. You get some vector of numbers and you, know, you can understand what this really means. Uh, but uh, they can capture some properties that were not obvious beforehand, so they could be very useful too. Um, speaking about classic anomaly detection task, uh, you can do a lot actually when you know 
things about your data. Uh, our data is all Kotlin code in the world, and you can hardly make any assumptions uh, about it. You don't know your distribution type for well, nothing. So we have to be really careful here uh, when applying these uh, techniques. Uh, the first two here, uh, just a brief overview, the first two here are very popular outlier detection techniques. Uh, they are good because they are assigning an anomaly score to each of uh, classifying objects uh, and uh, not just perform a binary classification. Also, they uh, do not make any assumptions about distribution of the data, which is good in our case. Uh, some clustering algorithms, including uh, the listed here, uh, well, also could be used for uh, anomaly detection uh, since they don't prefer that each element should be put in, a, uh, an, in some cluster. Uh, Autoencoder neural networks is a really fun uh, tool because uh, basically it's a neural network that has input and output, uh, th that has the same data as input and output. And uh, using its hidden layers, it tries to learn the identity function, basically. So the first part of the autoencoder is a decoder, uh, which tries to reduce the dimensionality of your data uh, and, well, create a hidden layer of values. And the second part is encoder that tries to reconstruct your data from these hidden uh, reduced dimensions. And if you get a reconstruction error, if you observe a reconstruction error, um, meaning that your predicted value uh, differs a lot from your uh, actual value, that's a normally candidate and you can just uh, do it like that. Uh, there's also one technique here which is not unsupervised learning technique, it's a semi-supervised learning, um, meaning that you have to uh, get some labeled data to train the classifier. But uh, it's also used for outlier detection and well, basically if we get some results, we can pass them to this one class SVM and get more results. So there's uh, a number of uh, algorithms available uh, to solve our task. So let's talk about, uh, about what we have done so far. Um, the workflow here is pretty straightforward. We get uh, code from GitHub uh, via GitHub API. Uh, we cloned and changed the, the compiler a bit to uh, serialize all uh, syntax trees that it builds uh, we ran uh, feature calculation on these trees. Uh, we ran algorithms on these features. We see, we look at the result and repeat. Uh, at some point, we take all anomalies that we've got, uh, go to Kotlin developer team, show them, and see if we need to change a course. Um, uh, today, I'll talk about three experiments that we've um, performed last year. Uh, well, now the data is different. Uh, for example, for the last year, the amount of Kotlin code uh, has doubled uh, on GitHub also. But anyway, uh, we uh, fetched all repositories that stated Kotlin as their main programming language that were not forks of any repositories and that were created before March. And that left us with, um, uh, removed the duplicates, uh, and that left us with about uh, 4 million functions and, well, uh, 9,000 uh, lines of code, uh, source files. Um, we decided, in these initial experiments, we decided to stick with functions as our analysis level. Uh, well, that was a design choice. So the first experiment uh, was very straightforward. We used explicit features and collected 51 of them, uh, describing different aspects of the code, as you can see here. Um, so we get, for each of 4 million functions, we get a vector of 51 uh, numbers, uh, which we managed to reduce to 20 using the PCA. It's a reduction, uh, dimension reduction algorithm, uh, which led us with uh, pretty much uh, the most of the variance that we needed, but much more friendly computation time. Uh, <clears throat> we ran a local outlier factor and isolation forests on it. 
uh, the contamination parameter here is basically the proportions uh, of outliers in the data set. And this is another design decision because we have no idea how many uh, anomalies is there. So we just set it to some small number, like one hundredth of a percent, to uh, keep the results observable by humans. Uh, that led us with one hundredth of a percent of four million, uh, four hundred uh, functions, which we manually observed and selected uh, 322 anomalies that could have been uh, of interest to language developers. Uh, another experiments used explicit, implicit features. Uh, we used uh, engrams, um, namely uh, unibind trigrams, on the syntax tree. Uh, this uh, simple uh, image shows uh, the you know, bigrams and trigrams on the syntax tree, but the idea is quite similar to these path based representations, but uh, simpler. And we use autoencoded neural net to uh, detect outliers um, here. We experiment. It, it was very simple architecture with only one hidden layer. We experimented with uh, uh, the compression rate of the hidden layer and got uh, around 360 anomalies. So we brought these anomalies together and uh, removed the duplicates uh, and still got a lot of anomalies uh, that we were not sure uh, were useful or not. Uh, we um, Looked them through and automatic, uh, and uh, manually labeled them. Uh, we got 23 types. Uh, uh, we uh, created a simple uh, web interface that allowed uh, Kotlin team developers to rank these anomalies one by one, uh, from one to five. And 12 out of 23 types uh, were considered very useful, uh, meaning rank four and five. This table. Uh, shows uh, this E1 column is experiment 1, E2 is experiment 2, error is rank. Uh, as you can see here, uh, most of the anomalies that were considered useful were lots of something. Uh, it's not this, that fancy and weird as we, as we anticipated to see, but mm, developers still found these anomalies useful and used them in their tests. Some examples. Uh, this is an anomaly with, this is a function with a when statement uh, having about 120 case branches. I sincerely hope it was automatically generated. Um, this one is a function with 22 generic type parameters. Uh, actually, this one is very useful because um, uh, our recent finding was that uh, compiler, uh, in some, well, compiler does a lot of work around generics. And in some complex, real complex cases, it could even reach exponential complexity uh, inferring types. So uh, code examples like this are actually very useful <coughs> for tests. Well, this is some weird test function. Actually, uh, this um, fourth compiler that I have showed before actually um, also have fallen to this strange code constructs group. And this one is good. Uh, this allowed us to file a bug to a parser. Uh, this uh, obviously incorrect uh, 400 plus uh, lines of code uh, actually break the parser with the stack overflow error. So we filed uh, a bug. And the third experiment here uh, that I'm going to talk about is um, features both static uh, source code analysis and bytecode analysis. Still, we don't want to compile any code ourselves, uh, but we need bytecode. What do we do? We created a tool that crawled uh, GitHub and try to find uh, release jar files for projects. Uh, it downloaded the files, uh, grabbed metadata from it, and tries to search uh, source codes uh, for these packages. Uh, that way, uh, we managed to grab uh, around uh, 40,000 source files and byte code for them, so we can compare the anomalies. Uh, the, the approach was the same using engrams and autoencoder that work. Uh, and you know, we uh, looked for uh, anomalies in uh, one uh, case and not anomalies in uh, another. That led us with uh, 38 conditional anomalies, uh, which um, one example that I will show you is this 10 lines of code function uh, that uh, turns into 4,500 byte code instructions. Uh, 
Well, this is not actually a bug in a compiler, as it turns out. Uh, it's a bug in the framework, or not a bug, but well, design feature. Uh, someone wrote a bind, very complex bind function uh, that was inlined, and someone wrote a code that inlined it nine times in a row. So it that it, it resulted in a huge bytecode. Uh, and that's an interesting example because uh, looking at the source code by itself, you can have a guess that that's some kind of a weird uh, code. So um, these were our initial experiments. Uh, now we are trying different algorithms for anomaly detection, different code representations. Now we have some labeled data, and we are finally free to use semi-supervised learning, like active learning or some other fancy stuff. Uh, a, a lot of our pipeline, pipeline is still uh, made uh, by hand, for example, clustering and labeling of these uh, obtained anomalies, which should definitely be automated. Uh, we can look at different structural levels, uh, not functions, but classes. Uh, on the other hand, we can look at feature-specific anomalies. For example, look for anomalies in loops, or look for anomalies in function signatures, and so on. Uh, we could look for anomalies in object interactions and some other ideas that were presented in the papers that I mentioned before. Uh, we can go deeper in the compiler and see which optimizations produce anomalies of any kind, and so on. And there's always Kotlin for Android, Kotlin Native, and Kotlin JS, each of which is a completely different world uh, with different anomalies. So, to sum up, uh, even our first very straightforward experiments uh, showed some useful results. Uh, our work is open sourced on GitHub. Uh, also, here is uh, our research group page. If you, in some way, interested in our work, feel free to drop us a message. And thank you very much for listening. We have some time for questions, so if you want to just raise your hand. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you used an open coder to find anomalies. Did you relate other types of algorithms? Uh, we have, yeah, uh, the, yeah. The question was about uh, whether we uh, tried some other algorithms to, uh, instead of uh, autoencoders. Well, for implicit times, uh, implicit features, we haven't. Uh, well, basically, we tried to see, uh, well, we have a lot of stuff to try. And we wanted to see if any of it works, because when we got the text description, just find us anomalies, uh, we weren't sure if we succeed at all. So we just tried this and this and this and this and got something working. Uh, yes, now we are doing different, um, well, more um, scientific approach when we try different algorithms on the same data and compare and stuff. But uh, I'm not sure I can talk about it yet. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I'm curious, uh, are there already some cases Yeah, uh, the question is whether uh, anything that we found uh, so far uh, well, influenced the language design uh, decisions. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's, that's the short answer. Uh, the more um, detailed answer is that uh, you don't really, uh, you, I, I think you can't really see that obvious uh, uh, what, what makes uh, people who uh, take decisions, uh, well, do this. So w we have presented several anomalies uh, that uh, could have led to some decisions, but, well, I'm not sure if uh, they will be taken into account, but uh, already we had some feedback, uh, some positive feedback on some anomalies that were, well, they could be used. I hope they will be used, but I think that takes time and some process. It doesn't work so bad. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay.
Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.